Well, welcome. Welcome to Australia's uh, Victoria Knight of the band Victoria K. Uh, we're going to be talking about her sophomore, her band sophomore album, uh, Core. Uh, the album is due to be released, uh, or was, should have been released on October 14th by Rock Shots, Rock Shots Records. Um, and their debut, uh, Sentia, was highly praised back in 2020, uh, earning Victoria Knight and uh, the band many awards, as well as festival and concert appearances. Uh, welcome, Victoria. Hey, <laughs> that was really nice, all the stuff that you said. Um, thank you for having me on. It's really, really exciting to, you know, be on here after you've done all the reviews and stuff. So it's good to finally get to talk and like, you know, get to do an interview. So thank you. No, you're more than welcome. Now, um, <clears throat> let's start with CORE, which is, um, as you described it, a modern day issues look, uh, uh, look at modern day issues through the Homeric uh, hymn uh, to Demeter. And basically the story of uh, Persephone. Uh, so I'll, I'll, that's the lead in. I'll let you fill in the details, yeah. but very, very cool that a metal band wanted to do a concept album. I'm used to doing uh, progressive rock reviews and it's so great to hear you guys taking a shot at that. And I think you did a fantastic job, but all right, I'm going to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so Kore is ancient Greek, um, and it's it's kind of makes it makes sense in the story. So it's Persephone's original name before she became Persephone, um, and basically the concept album is her story. And I wanted to draw on um, the hymn to Demeter because it's part of my Greek culture and my background. So I wanted to draw on my origins and my roots because it's something that's been a part of my life you know forever I remember learning about this specific story um through like the Greek classes that I would like study in and um like through my language courses and through my family so yeah um the story is um it's about the abduction of Persephone so Hades the god of the underworld sees Persephone picking flowers and he thinks she's the most beautiful thing um, he's ever seen. Mind you, Hades is Persephone's uncle, so that's a bit disgusting, but it's yeah. okay, as all myths are. But um, so he kidnaps her um, and takes her to the underworld. Um, and then Demeter's looking for Persephone, who is Persephone's mother. And Demeter, being the goddess of agriculture and the harvest, because she's so angry and upset that her daughter's been taken, the whole world dies. Um, and all the leaves fall off the trees and the food dies and the sun goes away and it's really cold and barren. So um, Demeter goes on this long journey to find Persephone, who's been taken and she's trapped in the underworld. Um, and she orders the people of the overworld to build a monument for them and she tries to mother another child because she misses her so much um all while this is happening Persephone is in the underworld and she changes her name from Kore which means daughter um to Persephone which means bringer of destruction so there's that little bit of an identity um Clash. happening there yeah um eventually Persephone is allowed to leave Hades lets her leave um, however, he tricks her into eating six pomegranate seeds and each pomegranate seed represents one month of the year. So she eats six. Um, and if you eat food in the underworld, you can't leave. And she didn't know that she was tricked into this happening. No. Um, so what a deal that they ended up making is that six months of the year, she has to stay with Hades in the underworld and six months of the year, she can go live with her mother. So every time she goes and lives with her mother, the trees blossom and fruits bloom. And so this is basically spring and summer. And every time she goes to the underworld, everything dies again. So it's autumn and winter. 
So it's kind of the cyclical, um, secular story of the seasons. Wow. Which is really cool. Yeah. Um, I think I, I studied this a long time ago, but thank you for refreshing my memory. Yeah. So it's really cool. But um, the story itself, it I think it encapsulates a lot of themes which are really important. Things like, um, of course, like the state of our earth, things like global yeah. warming, very, it's a very prominent theme. And then there's also like, um, I've interpreted it this way, um, slight hints of womanhood um, in certain sections of the story where Demeter yeah. reveals her divinity and orders the people to like build a tower in her honor. Um, it's kind of like that female empowerment type thing. So um, throughout the album, I kind of talk about um, body autonomy and female rights, as well as, um, you know, economical standards, things like social structures as well, um, looking at things like capitalism, um, which, you know, it's just how the world is today, but it's just, you know, things that I'm passionate about and want to talk about. And um, like the story also touches on like questions or like I've interpreted it this way, like I said before, um, questions about, you know, our beliefs and is there a God? Why do people have to believe things in order to exist? Um, so in, in a, a lot of things coming into this album, but I really wanted to talk about a lot of those ideas. And I found that I could do, the, do that through this hymn. So it kind of all worked out that way. That is really all encompassing. And I'm telling you over here in the US, with Roe versus Wade just getting chopped down, that is that whole female concept you were talking about there. That'll play well over here. People will want to hear about that. And we're hoping there's some changes coming uh, next week, yeah. and the week after with the midterms. But, um, but yeah, um, wow. You really picked the right time to do this. It's, I mean, yeah. you know, it's a, yeah, well it's a beautiful story. I mean, it's a intense story. Uh, and you picked the right time. I mean, we really need it. So I'm glad. I'm glad that I did. I just, yeah, I just really wanted to touch on those things, especially like, I think being a female, um, like having a lot of female, you know, friends, obviously. Um, <clears throat> it's just important to me. So I really wanted to bring it to light. And I'm glad that you guys appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. How has the album been received? I mean, um, I, yeah. So far, it's been received quite well. Um, you know, we've gotten quite a few reviews, such as the one that you've done as well, which we've absolutely loved. And we're glad to see Thank that you. people are really enjoying it. Um, to be fair, I was a little bit nervous to release this album, only because it's it's a bit of, it's a bit different from what the first one was. I'm kind of trying to move away from that stereotypical symphonic metal sound um, and trying to create something new. And people people seem to really appreciate that. And I'm yes. really, really happy about it. Um, it's, it's charted in a few countries in Europe. Um, it's charted in France, um, Finland, and I know it's also charted in Mexico. So I'm really, really happy with how everything's going. I can't, I can't be happier. I'm just really grateful. I'm looking forward to finally getting it. Uh... I've ordered it from Amazon and over hey. here. Well, everything uh, with the um, uh, shipping and stuff like that, it's just been crazy globally and especially here in the United States. And I'm one of those old guys that wants to have the hard copy. I mean, you, you guys sent me the, the uh, digital copy which is great but i still like you know being able to see the pictures and read the lyrics and uh yeah. Stuff like that. so yeah um can't wait to can't wait to get that Thank you. Thank and you. i did i did read on your facebook page you've done a couple shows you did one in adelaide uh tell us how's the crowd uh does the crowd sing the lyrics yet or do they know those or uh um. It depends on who comes to see us. Well, um, speaking of Adelaide, we came back yesterday of the time this is being filmed. Um, I got back last night, we drove. The thing about touring in Australia is everything's so far away from each other. 
So like to drive to Adelaide, it's about eight hours. Um, and then there's time differences as well. So that stuffs everything up, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so during- in Same thing over here, but yeah. Yeah, it's just cause there's nothing in the center of the country. Everything's on the outskirts. It's just, it's very barren. The so outback. For hours and just like this bush and this desert. And it's like really tiring. <laughs> um but yeah so we did that two days ago and it was an awesome show it was really really awesome show we were with some really cool bands um from Adelaide and from Victoria and it was a six band lineup it was really really fun um we had a lot of thrash thrash bands like those left behind um really really cool band from Adelaide and um Frankenbach who are from Melbourne and they're really cool as well but then you also had like some metalcore bands like um Alder Sky and I love metalcore music so I was really happy that that was there yeah. and then you had us who was like this symphonic metal frog thing um completely removed from everything else so it was a really interesting night um and the crowd the crowd loved the album since it hasn't been out for that long yet um some people like um came because they already heard the album and they know the songs and then some people came just to go out and see a show and we got a lot of new fans that night. So that's, that's really cool. We grew the VK family. Um, Excellent. Excellent. It was received really well live. Um, we performed it as the concept album. So from top to bottom. Like oh, you, good. good. Um, yeah. And it was, it was the first time doing it live like that. And people really seem to enjoy it because all the songs kind of mesh together. It's, it created a really cool atmosphere. So we're definitely going to be doing that again. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's been received really well live as well. So we're really happy with that. Are you talking about any uh, trips over here to the US? We'd love to have you for sure. <laughs> We'd love to. Um, we've been talking about it. We were actually talking about it yesterday when we were driving home. Um, we've, yeah, been talking about it, trying to like, maybe do a college circuit tour or um, yeah, just coming to the US and playing some shows. We'd love to come, same with Europe. Um, we're hanging to go. So we just got to kind of see where it all takes us. We have got more shows planned here in Australia. Um, we've got some tour dates and stuff planned that we're working on. But along with that, we're thinking about doing some overseas stuff as well, but nothing's confirmed yet, so. Uh, look look for uh, some other bands. I'll, I can send you an email uh, to maybe team up with and sort of share expenses. Uh, there's a bunch yeah. of bands that I've talked to that want to come over and uh, that'd be wonderful that, to see all of you at once. Uh, it'd be great. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of us want to come over, like from other bands that I know. So we're like, maybe we should go together. <laughs> the, yeah. yeah. Something like that. Yeah, that way you're, you're not taking on the full responsibility and costs and everything. And yeah. the visas and all that stuff. And uh, there's people don't realize it's just like, come, you know, come to the United States like it's down the street. And there's so much you have to do to prepare for it, getting all your instruments over and, you know, yeah. figuring out transportation when you get here. And people don't really think about that. They just, yeah, get over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's our job to think about. No one else's. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, but we, we'll sort it out. We're thinking about it. We're definitely trying to plan something. There's a lot of work to it, but thank you. I uh, appreciate hearing that. So uh, what was it like to sit back and develop a concept album? Uh, because I've, I've heard what it's like from a progressive standpoint, but from a metal standpoint, I'm interested in hearing what you did because I, I noticed you talked with some people and um go ahead talk um, about how that developed yeah yeah i wrote um the album i wrote the album during lockdown during 2020 so i remember the day that essencia was released i got a call from my producer he's like we need to start the new album now and i'm like oh yeah we do <laughs> oh we have to start writing something so um it was i had a few meetings with him and we were like, let's do a concept album. Just why not? And we were looking at a lot of different things. We were looking at Norse mythology. Then we could have like a folkier sound. 
And then we're like, what about Greek mythology? Because he's like, you're Greek. And I'm like, I am Greek. Let's let's make this work. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I remember writing it. First, it was a lot of research. So I had to get really familiar with the story. I didn't want to butcher it because that would be really bad. So um, No, you didn't. Yeah, oh, I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, so I got myself really familiar with the story. And I reached out to some people that I know from Greece, um, relatives. Um, I did a lot of my own study. I spoke to some of my mentors, my you know Greek mentors that I've had over the years. Um, one person that we spoke to, his name is Yanni Pantazis. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I a met scholar, him. right? A Greek scholar. Greek I scholar. Remember yeah. reading it. He's amazing. So I met him um, in 2016 when I went to Greece, just just to see family. But um, yeah, we reached out to him because he plays all the ancient instruments and he makes them himself. And he studies all these stories, incredibly smart, smart guy. Um, and he knows the stories like the back of his hand. So we reached out to him. We had a few meetings um, about getting everything authentically correct. And he provided us with like the original text because he has access to all of that. That's um, incredible. Incredible, yeah. It was a really like, I'm really blessed to be able to have that experience. It was really eye-opening. Um, and it was really beautiful to look at the stories from how they were meant to be received in a way um because there's so many different interpretations now but we wanted to get the yep. right one <laughs> um yep. so yeah he gave us the original texts and he gave us some sample sounds of instruments um that we could use and yeah because we use a lot of ancient sounds in our in this yes, you do. um so yeah i studied text then we broke the like the story up into sections so for this album it's like, I think there's seven actual songs, but then like one of them's the prologue and the epilogue, which makes nine. Um, so yeah, we, I broke it up into all the sections, the relevant sections, and just started writing, I guess. <laughs> I didn't write it in order. Um, a lot of the songs came together in parts, but I tried to kind of write it like a concerto. So yeah, yeah I'm a classical musician as well. I play viola and I've had experience in like these orchestras and stuff. And my producer as well, he's an amazing um, composer. He composes, you know, concertos and operas and stuff. Um, wow. So yeah, yeah, pretty cool team. So um, yeah, it is. I tried to look at it more, of, more from that perspective to try and make it a musical experience rather than just having one song after the other song after the other song after the other song, um, like what Essencia was. Mm -hmm. just just a different perspective um and the way that i wanted the album to be perceived kind of it gets more aggressive and chaotic towards the end because the story gets a bit more like effed up towards the end as well <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. um yeah so yeah writing a like a concerto having like the reoccurring themes and things like that was really really important um so after i wrote all of the musical parts and all the vocal parts. Um, I went into the studio with my producer and we went through everything, we refined everything and we wrote all the orchestral parts, which were then recorded in Budapest. Um, and everything was kind of recorded last year, um, like in and out of our lockdowns. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> no, that is, long, that's long a break. lot. Yeah, most yeah. most bands don't do all that and uh, don't go through all the the work you did, and uh, it's definitely appreciated from listeners like me. I hope other people um, appreciate. It. I'm glad you talked about that. I wanted you to talk about that because a lot of people think, "Oh, this is just beautiful music." Yeah, there's a lot of work behind it, and you really you went to the core source as much as you could. And uh, thank you, really, oh, thank you for you. doing it. <laughs> yeah, we just, we really wanted to be authentic, which is why we, you know, also with the Greek lyrics, we went to a translator. We didn't do that ourselves because I can't speak ancient Greek. I don't know yeah. anyone who can. So yeah, we just wanted to be real and authentic. So that's why we took time to do that. Definitely. That prologue, uh, so starting out with the album, the prologue, has, it has some of those Greek instruments, right? At least it sounds like it does. Yeah, so the beautiful prologue, opening. 
Yeah, thank you. So the prologue is made um, just drums, like timpani drums, which is, you know, an orchestral instrument. Um, and we have like a drone and this kind of runs through the whole album, like a singular note. <laughs> and that's a Greek bagpipe. So it kind of yeah. sounds like a hurdy-gurdy, which is like an ancient Celtic instrument. Yeah. Yeah, this ancient Greek instrument. Um, it's just a bagpipe. I think it's made out of like goat skin. Um, this well, scholar well. he made it, and it's it's really cool. But um, and then the melody we have um, it's a hammer dulcimer or a santuri, depends if you're looking at it from Greece or Persia. Um, yeah. yeah, and then we've got just whispers and voices, and then some throat singing in there too, which is buried, but it like adds to the ambience. So we just kind of wanted to create an ambient introduction to kind of set everyone up for the songs at the start of the album. So, yeah. Well, talk about the first song and Raptum uh, and how that developed. And uh... Okay, so, um, yeah. Raptum is the first part of the story, of course. Um, it's the part of the story where Persephone, Persephone, Persephone <laughs> gets abducted. Um, Raptum, I, I looked at Latin translations for words to try to get these song names. Um, Raptum is Latin for like taken or stolen. Stolen. Or yeah. raptured or something like that. Um, yeah, so it's the part of the story where she gets abducted and this song I really wanted to focus more on the emotional turmoil that she would have been feeling um and the earth is kind of dying at this point as well which is where a lot of the natural imagery in the song comes from mm -hmm. Persephone is the goddess of spring you know yeah. she needs to be there to create spring to create life um so the earth is dying around her and that touches upon that like you know the earth is dying kind of idea yeah yes yeah, so that one's pretty self-explanatory <laughs> Then Mother's Garden is one of my favorite. Um, and that, um, the great keyboards, uh, I remember that really well. Fast pace setting drums, um, symphonic moments, and then of course you singing. Um, talk about that one. That That's a beautiful song. This is I my thought. favorite as well. <laughs> is it? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so Mother's Garden. Um, this is from the perspective of Demeter, so the mother, yeah. and this is when the earth is dying, basically, just touching on those themes of, um, you know, erosion, global warming and things like that. Um, this one was my favourite one, I remember, when I put all of the parts together. Um, like, before I sent it into the studio, I always, I make all the songs digitally. Um, I remember putting all the parts together and playing in all the harp sections and yeah i it was my favorite <laughs> um i really wanted to capture like the melancholy and the lamenting you know energy that she would have been emitting and the energy that she would have been feeling at that time and that's why i wanted to take a darker route with the song um and make it more open it's it, it's got heavier themes in it like musically it's not as heavy as some of the other, most of the other songs, but yeah, I really wanted to make it like a, yeah, a lamenting kind of lullaby type thing. Um, yeah, I remember yeah. writing that harp section as well. That was my favorite. When I came up with it, I was like, yes, this is so cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, that one's probably the pretty, I think it's the prettiest one on the album and it's probably my favorite one too. So yeah, this is, yeah, Demeter's Grief when a daughter has been stolen. All right. And the child opens up with soft vocals from you. And then that wonderful symphonic orchestration, almost cinematic. Um, and the drums join in and soft chords. Uh, another great song. Uh, um, you want to talk yeah. about that a little bit or? Yeah. So this one is still kind of soft. Um, yeah. This is where um, Demeter, so she disguises herself as like an old hag um, and she goes to the king and queen 
of I think it's Ulysses and they need someone to take care of their son so Demeter disguised as this old woman um, takes care of the son every night however she dips the son in the eternal flame to try to turn the son into a god and make him immortal and the mum sees this queen and she's like oh my god you're you're burning my kid and then that leads into the next song so I'll talk about that more later but um, I interpreted this as Demeter lost her child and she wants someone to fill that void so she tries to take care of another child um, in replacement of Persephone and it's like she always has this like it's like the need to be a mother um, but she's always going to be empty inside no matter what because it's not her it's not her kid but um I love doing the orchestration on this one my producers did a lot of the orchestration on this one as well my favorite like out of all the songs this one has my favorite orchestration on it um yeah so that was another soft one but it's another kind of one that I wanted to capture that dark tone and that lamenting feeling yeah and then and then the action really gets going on uh, Persephone uh, that exchange the vocal exchanges between you and Charlie Cano, uh, your bassist, is uh, stark, but it's um, passionate. <laughs> Let's put it that way. It, it's really good. I mean, you feel the Greek, um, uh, what's the word, uh, the tragedy and everything. Oh, it, it really is excellent. Um, yeah, so this is, this isn't explicitly mentioned in the story, but um, yeah, this is basically just Persephone when she's in the underworld. Um, and this is when she changes her name from Corda to Persephone. So it's kind of like here is like women reclaiming their body autonomy, women reclaiming their rights, um, people reclaiming their own identity, um, discovering who they are, things like that. But um, Yes, this is the first song where the extreme vocals are featured, so it kind of breaks away from that. It's quieter, yeah. Softer kind of thing. Um, the, yeah, yeah, Charlie's just awesome. His vocals are really, really good. Um, I don't, I think I kind of really only sing the chorus in this one and the bridge, but um, yeah, I wrote it more like a duet and it's kind of, her two dichotomies, like it's the dichotomy of Persephone. Like, am I Kore? Am I Persephone? Who am I? Do I want to be tied to my mum forever? Or do I want to like be my own person? It's kind of that. So this was the first single off of the record too. And another one of my favorite ones. So yeah. And then uh, Divine Revelation is one of my, it's not, I think the tower is, is still my favorite, but uh, a divine revelation is probably second. Um, <clears throat> you really, I, I noticed that you really came alive during this song. Uh, I mean, you, you've been, yeah, I mean, your voice is what I mean, uh, really lifted on this one. And uh, it, well, go ahead. <laughs> you Thank you. So this one is kind of leading off of the child. So this is when Demeter, like after the queen, is like, oh my God, you're burning my child. Stop, you have to leave. She reveals that she's actually a goddess. And the queen is like, oh shit, <laughs> <laughs> goddess. Uh, I, I stopped up. But um, yeah, so this is about specifically, um, I was really passionate about writing this one. Yeah, it's about so you could feel like, you singing. Female, female empowerment, basically. It's like, from a perspective of what would it be like if women reclaimed society and we lived in a matriarchy instead of like a patriarchy kind of thing. So like, um, yeah, this one I'm very passionate about. <laughs> Extremely passionate about. Um, yeah. I bet you that comes through in the live performance too. Oh, I'm glad. Awesome. <laughs> I was just angry when I was singing it. But um yeah, it's kind of like, what would it be like if we lived in a matriarchy? What would it be like if women were in power? Like to have that motherly influence, you know, what would happen? So that's kind of what that is. But this is where she reveals her divinity in the story. Excellent. 
And then Tower. I, I just love Tower. Uh, oh, nice. <laughs> go ahead. And, and oh, yeah, the Tower brings up one question that I've been wanting to ask you too. There's a video for that and a fantastic video. Uh, there's one for Persephone. Will there be more videos? Because you do a great job on videos. Thank you. Um, our videographer, Gary Robinson, is awesome. We've been working with him since Essentia. Um, we haven't really thought about it yet. Maybe it's something in the future. We don't know. Um, yeah, I can't really say anything on that. But Tower was the second single off of the album. I think it's the longest song on the album. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's a lot heavier than a lot of the other tracks, which is I really like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, this one is where Demeter orders the people um, of Ulysses to build a tower for her and her daughter. So I look at it from a few different perspectives. One of them is um, the perspective of the working class or the middle class or the lower class um in everyday society yeah being like oh but we're exploited to fulfill um the needs of society and that's just how it is though yeah. um, i just thought it was something cool to talk about and then um i also try to look at it from a philosophical standpoint asking um like our whole like back all through human history everyone's kind of worshipped these monuments or these, you know, colossal beings, and why do we still worship these monuments and colossal beings? Is there something actually out there that's pulling us towards this worship? Or are we just wired to be that way? And also asking why do we worship celebrities and, you know, massive companies and things mm -hmm. like that? So that's kind of what that song's about. Excellent. Um, Blasphemia. Oh, okay, so I like this one too. This one kind of has, um, maybe it's because of my upbringing. I listened to a lot of Greek music when I was little. Um, I still do. I love Greek music. Um, yeah, I didn't get anything from the Middle East. Yep. Yeah, awesome. But you can kind of hear it in the song, like the rhythm that it's playing. It almost sounds like it's in a 7-8 time signature, um, even though it's in 4. But um, yeah, like the drum pattern is very, very similar to Middle Eastern drumming. So yeah. I wanted to kind of put that in there. It was kind of subconscious, but it happened to happen. Um, this one is, it has a lot. It has a lot of different sections. It has the folk section in the middle, and then it has the thrash sections. Um, I kind of just wanted to capture a lot in this song. But this is part of the story, is Hades' deception, um, where he deceives Persephone into eating the pomegranate seeds. And it kind of... Um, the question that it asks is like, how do we know what we're living and what we're doing is real? Um, how do we know that our beliefs are real? You know, how do we know that what we see is real? You can't just trust your senses, things like that. Yeah, mm. very much so. Um, we're uh, probably going to, I mean, this uh, Zoom is probably going to end. Uh, can you hang in here and uh, we'll finish the rest of the album? Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll keep going because uh, I think we've got a couple more minutes left. Uh, let's talk about Pomegranate. Okay. So Pomegranate is another one of my favorites. And whenever we perform it, the audience seems to resonate with this one a lot. No. Oh, okay. Because the hook part, the... Uh, yeah. Uh, that part, everyone loves that part. <laughs> I always sing that one for sound check. But um, yeah, so this is where she eats the pomegranate seeds and it's kind of like, oh, I'm almost free, but I'm not actually free. That's kind of what that is. Um, this was the first song. Finds out the truth. Yeah. Yeah. But um, this was the first one on the album that we actually wrote and that we put together and we based the whole album off of the sound of this one song. Yeah. And yeah, that chorus is still my favorite chorus in the whole album. And it's really fun to perform. And it has a lot of different sections. Like it has the speaking part. Um, and that ancient Greek section that's spoken, that's directly from the original text. So I read that, yeah, out of the original text. Just verbatim, to, yeah. Yeah, verbatim. So that's that's really cool too. But yeah, um, yeah we wanted to create more of a, a journey with the song. And we really hope we did that. 
I think you did. Yeah, you definitely did. Um, the afterlife. Yeah, so this is the end of the story um, where Persephone's returned to her mother and the world blooms again. Um, but inevitably she has to go back to the underworld. It's so not it's quite of, the happy ending everyone yeah, wants. Yeah. It's like it's a perceived happy ending, but it's not actually happy. Um, you know, it's kind of like facing the reality and like life's like that too. Like you think things end yeah. well, but they don't generally do. Like something, there's always a consequence of an action. And it's kind of talking about um, cyclical nature of life, how it's just, it never, it, it never stops like it's just gonna the same thing's just gonna keep going around and around and around and the, the story is just gonna keep repeating itself so that's kind of what that one's about all right and then the the last track um is uh, epilogue and that that's a beautiful piano piece um do you, you got a piano back you did you play that or <laughs> i didn't play it um uh, someone from the orchestra in budapest okay. played it but um I do is, is that your favorite instrument um yeah i think so i play viola as well um they're my probably my two main instruments little classical nerd but um <laughs> oh, wow, that's good thank you um no i love piano that's where i write all my music so but yeah so epilogue that piano melody is from blasphemia if you listen close I enough but um that's just kind 